all the way over here to the right. So this is section 3.6. Section 3.6 of logs and inverse trig functions. I put that in parents because we're going to be doing that after we do this whole logarithm business. So first, derivatives of logs and second, inverse of trigs. Let's first review what a logarithm does. A logarithm is first an inverse to an exponential with the same base. And when you compute it, It's the power to that exponential, to an equivalent exponential, I should say. I gave you, say, a table of values, something like this, uh, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Pretty obvious these are powers of 2. If I ask you the question, what power of 2, and you just listed those here, what would you say? It's just two to the zero. So zero. This one is two to the first. So one. So if you just listed those powers next to them, it's not a very difficult task, right? What you're actually doing is this. You're actually computing the logarithm. And which logarithm are you computing? You're actually computing the log base 2. So there's our equivalent exponential 2 to the x. And you're plugging in these values over here. So the logarithm itself, it's an inverse to some exponential. And it's the inverse to the exponential that has the same base. Here we have powers of 2. And if you want to know what you plugged into that power, well, that's what the logarithm tells you. The numerical power. Like literally the power itself, not the result of the power, but the numerical power. Okay, so this is what logarithms show us. And just to review a little bit more about them, we'll look at maybe a graph we'll just use this. So I'm going to plot in blue and green the logarithm base 2 of x and I'll plot uh, the exponential 2 of the x. I'll actually try to do this justice. Two to the zero is one. Two to the first is two. Two to the second is four. Two to the third is eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It goes up really fast on the right. On the left, two to the negative one is one over two to the first, so that's one half. 
2 to the negative 2 is 1 over 2 to the second, which is 1 fourth, and then 1 eighth, and then 1 sixteenth, and 1 thirty second, and it gets really, really close to that x axis, but never crosses. So the exponential 2 to the x does this, has a horizontal asymptote. That means the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 2 to the x is 0. And the logarithm tells us the power of our input. Hmm. Is there any way we can plug in these negatives? Like what's the log base 2 of negative 1? We have to then ask ourselves, is negative 1 on the list here? And does it correspond to some power of 2? We've got a positive number, we're raising it to some power. Can we ever get a negative out? Yeah. No. So this does not exist here. Which means, for any negative number, the logarithm doesn't exist. It's not fine there. So there's not going to be anything graphed to the left of the y-axis for the logarithm. Right? But we can ask ourselves all these questions about you know, where else is it defined over here and what is that value. The easiest one is right here. We plug in 1, we get 0. We plug in 2, we get 1. Plug in 4, we get 2. Plug in 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, we get 3. What if we plug in 1 half? That's 2 to the negative first. What about 1 fourth? That's 2 to the negative second. So negative 2. 1 eighth is 2 to the negative third. 1 sixteenth is 2 to the negative fourth. 1 thirty second is 2 to the negative fifth, and so forth and so on. So the logarithm has a vertical asymptote. You able to take a quiz? Yeah. Okay, awesome. There you go. So the logarithm is just this exponential reflected about this line. Y equals x. That's something we learned about inverse functions earlier in the year. If we just take the blue or the green and rotate around this line of y equals x, we have achieved or we have obtained the graph of the other. Right? They're exact rotations of each other around that axis. Okay. So the question is, what's the relationship today? What's the relationship between the slope of a log and some other function? Is there, is there some function that gives us, for any input here, the slope of this green line? That's the topic for the day. It should agree, you know, with what that graph tells us. For example, can you tell me the sign of the slope of a log graph? What's the sign of this slope on the log for any point? S-I-G-N, not sign, S-I-N-E.
and it's always that means it's always positive for logs. The derivative of a log is positive always, and at zero, the derivative of a log is what? What happens at the log? What happens at zero for logs? Yeah. Yeah. If I pick points closer and closer and closer to the x axis or the y axis, so I plug in smaller and smaller axes, the slope just gets bigger and bigger and bigger to positive infinity. That should be clear from the graph. At infinity. So as x goes to infinity, the derivative of a log is, okay, here you just got to kind of stare at the graph for a little while. The logarithm keeps going up, right? Like it, 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 if I give you any power of 2, there is a power on it, right? So if I give you a bigger and bigger power of 2, that just means the power got bigger and bigger. So if I give you a list of bigger and bigger powers of 2, the output of the logarithm of those would be bigger and bigger numbers. So this never stops going up. But it goes up more and more slowly all the time. The logarithm grows very slowly. And you can see that you know, here, it's got infinite growth, but already right here, this, the growth has slowed down more, a lot. And then it's slowing down even more and more and more. So at infinity, what would you guess the slope is going to be? Zero. Almost as if it stopped growing, even though it doesn't. We'll see that. These are all nice little conceptual ideas about the logarithm and just getting the information about its derivative from the graph. So what is the derivative? What is it as a function? Now I can give you any base and we could answer this question. But we're going to start with the simpler, the simplest base we can think of, which actually is not a simple number at all. You remember when we worked with exponentials? The first one that we did was e, e, right. And the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Great, yes, very simple. The natural log corresponds to the natural exponential, right? So I wrote up here earlier, logs are inverses to a corresponding other exponential, right? So instead of just answering this question in general to begin with, we're going to press pause. That's not 11. Pause. And we're going to do this one instead first. So here we go. Actually, your book does this in uh, general terms first. Well, that kind of backfired on me. Oh, I want to do this one first. So here we go. Natural log of So right away, at the very beginning, we know if y is the natural log of x, 
that there's this corresponding exponential which says that e to the y is x. If y is in fact the result of taking the natural log of some number, then y is the power of e that gives us x. Remember the table I made with the twos earlier, power of two. Can we differentiate e to the y? I would hope so, right? Okay, so we're going to differentiate this implicitly, and then we're going to draw results of this. And this is actually part of a larger technique called logarithmic differentiation that we're going to get into later today. But um, we're going to apply implicit differentiation to that. because we know how to take the derivatives of e to the x. So we're going to take the derivative with respect to x of that I'll do the easy one, like always. Derivative with respect to x of x is 1. <laughs> All right, your turn. Derivative of e to the y implicitly, let's see if you remember last time, is e to the y times y prime. Chain rule. You apply the chain rule. Y is some function, right? Y is some rule, but we can pretend that we don't know it. So when I differentiate e to the y, my inner function is y, my outer function is e. So I take the derivative of this, I take the derivative of the outer, plug in the inner, well that's e to the y still, times the derivative of the inner, which was y. we solve this for y prime? Absolutely. This is 1 over e to the y, just through division. And what is e to the y? x. Power of implicit differentiation. We're trying to find the derivative of natural log of x, but we throw up our hands and we say, I don't know, I don't know anything about this except its graph. And the fact that there's an equivalent exponential. I take the derivative of this guy implicitly. I solve it for y prime. I resubstitute back in my equivalent explanation for y. And I find the derivative of this thing. So the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x for any non, also positive, I should say, x. And that's it. The natural log's derivative is very simple. 1 over x. Questions about this process? Okay, now my questions that follow are right here. Is this always a positive number? 1 over x, where x is a positive number? Yeah, definitely positive. At zero, so if x goes to zero, maybe the proper way to write this, since we can't plug in zero, do we get positive infinity? Yes. 
when we plug in or go to infinity, do, does this derivative go to zero? Yes. Okay. So these sort of qualitative things about the derivative of water given that function. So this is our list. The next thing then to put on this list is the answer to the first question. What is the derivative of that? There's two ways to go about this. And we can make this all apart. Do you remember the change of base formula? That's option one. We can convert this logarithm into a natural logarithm, and that just throws the answer at us right away. Or we just go to the exponential equivalence relation here, and we take the derivative that way. We know how to take derivatives of any exponential. There's a logarithm of the base that comes out, so we can just throw it down that way. You want to see one or the other? Unpause. Which one do you want to see? Doesn't matter to me. The second one? Okay, sure. So if we know that y is the logarithm with some base b, maybe e, maybe not, of some x, then there's this equivalent exponential which says that b to this power is x. Why? Right? Okay. Just like before, we implicitly differentiate this guy. I'll do the easy part. <laughs> and ask you, maybe you can do the harder part. Derivative of x is 1. What's the derivative of b to the y with respect to x? Natural log b. Natural log b times? Y b. Sorry? Is it y prime? You also need that. And? B to the y. This is the chain rule. The derivative of b to some power is the log of that base times that thing again. In the natural log case, this is just 1. And so you get just e to the something. So here this is not 1, so we have this that comes out. Then times the derivative of the inner function. Okay, that's something that we saw uh, before. I'll write it down here. Good memory, by the way. Following still? This implicit differentiation business here? Okay. Okay, so now we just solve for y prime. Just like before, we have 1 over natural log of b times b to the y. But b to the y is. natural log with one modification, just like with the derivative of the, you know, generic exponential. We take the derivative of this with some constant. Okay. 
that's our result. So now we've got those in our full box, and they just came from that implicit differentiation. Let's do some examples. Can I erase the derivation? I'll leave that over there, but the middle. examples we've done. The reason I'm going to do that is because the natural logs require a specific domain. So beware. Logs require positive inputs. So when you take derivatives, of logarithms, and then you're asked to compute a value or something or another. You need to be really careful about what things you can compute and which things you can't compute. The first one I'm going to ask is just this one. What is the derivative of that? We're going to have to apply the chain rule because we've got a function inside another function. So the derivative of this is the derivative of the outer function, which is natural log, which is 1 over the input, composed with our inner function, times the derivative of our inner function, which is just 1. So f is our outer function, that's natural log of x. The derivative is 1 over x. g of x, the inner function, is x minus 1. It's derivative 1. Derivatives of compositions are the derivative of the outer composed with the original, so that's 1 over x minus 1, times the derivative of the inner. So this derivative is this. So now my question what is the, the derivative at x equals negative? innocent question. Here's some input. What's the slope of our original function at this input? So here's our function that tells us that, right? So we plug in, right? And why not? That's negative. When I plug it in here, I get a negative. And no one can tell me what the natural log of negative 3 is because there's no power of e which gives me negative 3. Now this function kind of says, hey, I can plug in anything but 1. Right? I mean, if I erase this left side, this perfectly valid question, what is 1 over x minus 1 at x equals negative 2? It's negative 1 third. But when you picture this as the derivative of a natural log, it's coming from something that has certain limitations, we can't answer that question.
next one. The sine of natural log of x. Natural log can give out any real number. Anything from negative infinity to positive infinity. Sine has a domain of any real number, so things match up. This composition is nice. So what's its derivative? We're going to have to use the chain rule. Our outer function is sine. Its derivative. Our inner function is natural log. Its derivative. Say what's in your mind real quick. Cosine and 1 over x. So the derivative is cosine of natural log of x times 1 over x. And where is this defined? For what values can I find the slope of our original function? Natural log can only accept positives. So this is only defined for positives. Otherwise, the derivative is undefined. Or d any. For the middle one. Yeah, for the one. Yeah, so, no, this is the bottom one, because yes. it would be ln absolute b. Of b. So why couldn't you do that in the middle? Okay, good. Um, why isn't there an absolute value here? Yeah. Yeah, you see that quite frequently. And that forces you then to have, like, let me, um, right below this, write the question now, so you see what's going on. This is a nice way of getting around the problem, actually. So here, we can't plug in anything smaller than 1. What can we plug in here? Anything but 1. If we plug in 1, we get 0. And I don't know what the natural log of 0 is. But anything except 1, we can plug in. So now take the derivative of this. What does that translate into over here? Well, it translates into two different things. Okay. So if x minus 1 is less than 0, this becomes the natural log of 1 minus x. And then, definition of absolute value says, yeah. if you have a negative, you negate it. Yeah. If x minus 1 is greater than 0, don't do anything, this is just the natural log of x minus 1. Take derivatives now of these guys. This derivative, well sorry, this derivative we have, because this is what we talked about before. Um, this has a negative sign by it. It's 1 over 1 minus x times The derivative of the bottom, the inside, rather, which is times negative 1, which is that. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so 
So, yeah, like, uh, I think the question she brings up is a very valid question, very good question. Um, that comes up often when you're looking at a textbook which lays out every gory detail. And it's trying to define these things in the most general sense. This thing's not defined for anything less than one. This thing's defined for anything but one. This is much broader, but requires more exposition to get the result for. Um, but it's, in the end, right, the same. You just need to, you know. I remember my calculus teacher back in the day just saying like, oh, who cares about absolute values? Just, just work it out. <laughs> but I don't want to say that to you so much. But, but there is like this logic puzzle for every problem, right? And if you've got a little, something that's a little different, there's just a logical game that you play of how do you slide the, the tiles around in order to get the picture in the end. Um, and that, that's a skill that we all should be developing for things such as this. Is that clear why we, what, what I'm saying and why that results in the same thing? Yeah. Okay. The same result held over here, if you remember, this required the natural log of the absolute value of B, technically, because B could be negative. But for most applications, you're never gonna use a negative. What's the funny phrase? 80% of the time works every time. Okay. So most of the time this is positive anyway, and so these are redundant. Yeah. To get around that in textbooks, you often see that. So you just gotta reason through why that's there, and it's usually just a quick what if it's negative, what if it's positive. Okay. That's actually example six in the book. Natural log of absolute value of x. Okay. Cool. Great question. So this leads me to a nice little tool. We got these in our short-term memory. This is a process, this is a tool that can be used to find derivatives, kind of in the same way that we use implicit differentiation, right? That was a process, it was a tool we used to find derivatives. Um, this is going to be something similar where you're given a function and you do this to it and you quite easily find the derivative. So this is a tool, as I'll say, a tool to use when your function is gross, like really complicated. That's what I mean. Literally the first example of this in your book is disgusting. So I'll write it down. x to the 3 fourths times the square root of x squared plus 1 divided by 3x plus 2 to the fifth power. Because why not? 
if you think through how you would find this derivative, you'd have an application of a product rule, an application of a chain rule, an application of a quotient rule, another application of a chain rule. Wow. Lots of things going on there, right? First you'd apply the quotient rule, you say it's the derivative of this times this, so you, the derivative of this is a product rule, and then in that product rule the derivative of that requires the chain rule. Minus this times the derivative of that, which requires a chain rule application, divided by this thing squared. Lots of steps. This process brings that down quite a lot. So this is a process or a tool to use when your function is pretty gross. And it's all reliant on, so I'm going to write this over here. So you probably want to leave some space in your notes. But this works because I want us to remember these things. Remember, if we have a logarithm of a product, what that turns into? It turns into the sum of logs. That's really nice for differentiation because to take the derivative of this means you can take the derivative of this, and that just means you take individual derivatives, not the derivative of the product. There goes our product rule. We don't need to do it anymore. What about this one? Wherever we would apply a quotient rule, we instead take the difference of derivatives of the individual pieces. There goes our quotient rule application. What about chain rule? Well, this would be a function raised to some power, so we have to apply the chain rule. But this rule from logarithm says no. Just take the derivative of that and multiply it by the power. Goodbye, chain rule for simple powers. The easy rules for logarithms, when applied here, eliminate products and quotients and chains. So let's see it worked out, right? This is why it's our function. We're going to take the log of your choice of either side. Okay? The log of your choice. Choose what say. What log would you like to choose? I know one of my professors would choose base 42 because that's the answer to anything and everything. Other professors would not. Which one would you choose? You can't be wrong, so long as you don't give me a negative number. What's a natural choice? The natural law. Why is that the natural choice? We remember the derivatives we have here, the ones that are in our short-term memory. <laughs> Derivative of natural log of something is 1 over that something times the derivative of that something. That's the chain law application. A different base was 1 over that something times the natural log of that base. So there's extra constants which come up when you don't use the natural log. So from here on, maybe we can just have like an agreement, professor, student, agreement. You'll only use natural logs. Please and thank you. Yeah? OK, I'll need to prick your finger and sign the contract on the way out of the room. <laughs> OK, so we're just going to take natural logs. So this process, logarithmic differentiation, works because of those rules. And here's how you do it. First, take logs.
natural log of y. This, we're going to take the natural log of, and I'm just going to apply all of these rules all at once. I see a quotient, so this is the natural log of the top minus the natural log of the bottom. But that last rule says I can take this power in front. The top is going to go here, minus the natural log of the bottom. That's this rule. The last rule there says I can take this power and multiply it in front. Follow it? This is a product, and I'm going to erase this and slide it over. The natural log of this product is the sum of the natural logs But these have powers in them, so I can bring the powers in front. Last rule. So it's three fourths the natural log of x. That's this. Plus one half natural log of this, minus 5 natural log of f is the natural log of y. At this point, if you chose a different base, nothing would be different. You just have a different log written down. 2. Implicitly differentiated. only thing that is, is a problem here is the natural log of that y. Because now we have a function inside of another function, and the rule for that function is this, which is the thing we wanted to avoid finding the derivative of explicitly right away. So we're going to take the right side implicitly. Natural log of y's derivative is, one, it's not there anymore, is 1 over y. But then we multiply by its derivative. So the derivative of the right is the derivative of the inside, which is the thing we are hoping to find, but hoping to not do explicitly, divided by y, because the derivative of natural log is 1 over what's inside. Yeah? On the left. Some of these are really easy, right? This is just 3 fourths times 1 over x. The derivative of this is just one half, that's that, times one over what's inside, times the derivative of what's inside, because that's the inner function. Chain rule, right? So 2x. Chain rule there. Minus 5 times 1 over. 3x plus 2 times the deriv derivative of the inner function, 3x plus 2, 3. Can I solve this for y prime? Absolutely. Just multiply the left side and the right side by y. Multiply by y. Multiply by y. This tells us right away what our derivative is. 
without ever applying the quotient, sorry, the, yeah, the quotient or the product rules. We did have to do some chain rules. Exactly the number of factors we had in here, the number of them. But we have our derivative. y prime is y times this, 3 fourths times 1 over x plus 2x, 1 half, I didn't simplify, 1 half and 2 simplifies, so it's just x over x squared plus 1 minus Anything simplify? No, 15 over 3x plus 2. There it is. A rather disgusting initial formula to take a derivative of with quotients and products done in two lines and a few chain rules. Much preferred, I would say. Are we going to have to type this all in the microphone? That's a long start. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the only thing worse than taking quotients and products and derivatives is typing the results into what is that? Yes. I feel your pain. Having tutored now in the tutoring room for three years, I feel your pain. I, you know, because when the student, when it works out for the students, they never come in and ask. But when it's not working out, that's when they come in and ask. So we only get like the harder problems of why won't this work? <sighs> um, we've got two minutes left. There's no way we're doing inverse trig derivatives today. So I'll run through one more quick one of these. It really does not take very long at all. What's the next one that they give us? They don't. Never mind. Or we can just pick a random strange function. And go. <laughs> Some people are like, no, I have it. I'm done. Fair enough. Fair enough. We'll finish with this next time doing inverse trig functions. Have a great weekend.